Thank you to our Slavic choir. Uh, what a blessing they have been and are and will continue to be. And I have good news. We are going to be starting a general church choir, of which I hope several of them will join. And we will be enjoying the blessing of singing and worshiping together. So we'll have more details for you soon in regards to that. But thank you so much. Let's pray. Father, we've gathered on this beautiful fall afternoon to be blessed and to bless you. So now may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts as we commune with you through your word be acceptable in your sight. Guide us now, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. I entitled my message this morning, Give Us Leaders, Nature, Nurture, and a Failure of Nerve. I'm beginning a series of sermons on leadership, very, very important. We are all affected by leaders. We are all, at some point in time in our life, leaders. The capacity for leadership is different, with different temperaments, different character, and different personality. The call to leadership is everywhere, and the longer you live, the more likely it is that you will be called to leadership. But everybody listening to me today is affected by leaders, and the culture that we create is disproportionately a function of leadership. Now, I want to read you a few quotes and I believe in the preparation for this sermon, there's something significant about my own self that I've learned, even reflecting on this between first and second service. I'm going to read a few paragraphs from a book entitled Failure of Nerve by Edwin Friedman. This is the challenge. This is the context. You need to ask yourself, is this the context of my heart, my home, my church? He believes it's the context of American society. He says, my thesis here is that the climate of contemporary America has become so chronically anxious, I want that phrase to stick in your mind, that our society has gone into an emotional regression that is toxic to well-defined leadership. What is he saying? Everybody is so stressed that instead of having the boldness in their hearts to actually strike out, take some risk, and make it different, they are in it. We are in a regressive period where we would prefer security over what's required to change the situation we're in. He goes on. American civilization's emotional regression has perverted the elan of risk-taking, discovery, and pioneering that originally led to the foundations of our nation, shaping much of its fundamental character into an elusive and often compulsive search for safety and certainty. He's saying we've given up on the principles that established this nation and now instead of exercising that emotional energy to take risk and go forward, we're now in a compulsive search for safety and certainty. He says this is occurring equally in parenting, medicine, and management. Now why would he pick out those three? Parenting, medicine, and management. Now if this book had been written in the last year or two, you could not have to wonder so much why he'd choose medicine. Because we just went through a period of time in our American worldwide culture where medicine, instead of practicing medicine and taking risks to figure out what we could do to mitigate a pandemic, we were locked down into one approach. And nobody seemed willing to challenge the system. But he mentions management, which would affect most workplaces, and he mentions parenting, which is the great incubator of lives with leadership confidence and risk-taking ability. The anxiety is so deep within the emotional process of our nation, this is written 30 years ago, that it is almost as though a neurosis has become nationalized. Now I want you to think about this. If in fact a neurosis, a neurosis has become nationalized, it might explain why so many people just keep their heads down when somebody's got to stand up and say, wait a minute, we're going the wrong way. At the same time that a society is progressing technologically, it can be regressing emotionally. Again, this is almost prophetic. When a society or any institution is in a state of regression, it will put its technological advances to the service of its regression so that the more it advances on one level, the more it regresses on another. Now, if there's one thing you need to know about producing leaders, 
They cannot be produced in anxious systems. So if you're home, you're constantly worried about your kids, you're not producing the kind of character and confidence they're going to need to face a world that's becoming more and more regressive and neurotic. All right, I want everybody to think about this. The kids can't be worrying about mom and dad's marriage. There needs to be a clear statement. Mommy and daddy are together. They're in for the long haul. And the kids can't be related to by their parents like they're fragile. I mean, come on, they're, they're almost, well, the phrase that comes to my mind, they're almost practice dummies for the parents, but they're not. But the parents in their newness of what they're doing are learning as they go. You know, there used to be an old commercial that said, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Every parent needs to know this about their kids. They're going to be okay. As a matter of fact, they've got to go through a few hard things. But here we have all these technological advances. I don't even have my cell phone in my pocket right now. But as we have more and more opportunity to not put the effort into socializing with each other, we socialize with our phone and we go into a regressive, almost isolationistic neurosis. Uh, this man is almost prophetic. He's dead. He was a Jewish psychologist. The focus on data and technique itself is a character of emotional regression. Namely, it's an advance or denial of the fact that it's even happening. Have you noticed? Do you think it's any wonder why we have what we call political correctness these days? It's because people want security. Uh, they, they want leaders that don't rock the boat. They actually want to find that sweet spot for security. And so consequently, nobody's supposed to be different or challenge what's wrong. There's no way out, he writes, of a chronic condition. Now listen, you're in a bad marriage? You got a bad parenting dynamic going on? This sermon's for everybody. But if you're in a situation where something's wrong relationally, he says there's no way out of a chronic condition unless one is willing to go through an acute, temporarily more painful phase. Every leader, listen, every parent, every manager, every boss, hear what he's saying for it is categorically true. You have a dysfunction in a relational setting. The only way out of it is going to require a temporarily more painful situation. But most individuals and social systems, irrespective of their culture, gender, or ethnic background, so everybody's saying, will naturally choose a revert to the chronic conditions, the dysfunction, the bearable pain, rather than face the temporarily more intense anguish of conditions that are about getting out of that bearable pain. They are the gateway to becoming free. Now, if you can't look back on the last two years or look back on your life and see some places where it appears that we've accepted the chronic diagnosis of dysfunction rather than being willing to follow the doctor's orders, the spiritual physician's directives, you need to understand this series of sermons is for everybody because somewhere in the point of your life, you're going to be called upon by God to exercise influence upon a person or a situation. That is leadership. Some are at much higher posts where much more depends on what's going on. But everybody is affected by leaders and everybody eventually will have some form of divinely compelled responsibility to influence a situation. That is leadership. Now, I want to say right from the very beginning, especially reflecting on last week, and by the way, if you've not watched the testimonies from last week, I watched one yesterday afternoon while I was exercising. I watched Taisha Holt's testimony where she challenged the church to get ready to receive people that are broken and they're manifesting it in the form of deviant sexual expression, confused same-sex attraction. She was challenging us, and in the midst of it all, if there's a theme that was running through this last week, I, I mean, I learned many things. But one thing I want to make sure that everybody gets very clearly is that while there are questionable moments in the fluidity of someone's sexual identity development, the last thing you want in that mix is a child who's been given ready access to pornography so that you can turbocharge it and turn it into an addiction. All right? I hope everybody's listening. The last thing you want is to put in the hands of a child something we call a smartphone, which must be one of the dumbest things we can do prematurely. I mean, the devil's slick. He doesn't miss a chance on anything, does he? But if there's one thing that became clear to me is that pornography internet addiction is almost like a glove 
in which you can put the hand of gender fluidity confusion and you can make a person bound for the rest of their lives by sexual experiences and encounters. Now, if there's another thing that came out of last week, it's this, that there is a story to every person who's been traumatized and confused. And if I ever believe what Malachi says, that God hates divorce, I'm going to tell you, I understand why he hates it more today than ever before. I'm preaching on leadership, but I'm here to tell you this. When there's an absence of a two-party development system in the home, the child is gravely disadvantaged, especially when who's missing is the dad. Because the dad has a different kind of leadership. The mom has a kind of leadership. They are to be complementary and partnership. But there's a terrible wound on the leadership potential of a child when the parents treat the child like they're fragile. There's a definite wound on there when the parents separate. It's hard to build confidence, which is an emotional risk-taking platform for leadership. You can't go into a neuroses of security and safety and expect to get somebody who has the emotional ability to do what leaders do, and that is take risk. By the way, there's a quote in the front of his book. It says, ships are the safest in a harbor, but that's not why ships are built. And I want everybody to be thinking about this. You want to prepare young people that are strong and confident? Keep your marriage strong and confident. Make sure the kids know mommy and daddy are like this. They're not coming unwound. And occasionally there's stress fractures there. Sticking in a marriage says to the kids, you can stick with things. It builds confidence through all the ages. Traumatized family systems can set tremendous limitations on the future emotional development of a child's life, which is the foundation for leadership. The leader is not someone who has the most facts, the most data, the, the biggest data sets. The leader is the person who has enough data to make a decision and can make a decision and live with it. This is what leadership is about. And Parenting 101 is where most leadership is both being developed and exercised. I was visiting with someone not too long ago, and they had heard some of my sermons about some of the more traumatic moments in my childhood. Let me be very clear. The big epiphany that has come upon me, even in reflecting between first and second service, is this. And that is that in spite of a few punctuated moments of trauma and what I'll call some systematic dysfunction in my family's life, I have come to a conclusion about my own person this morning. I actually had asked my mom, Mom, get some pictures together of me. Get a few pictures together of when I was born. I might, I might want to show them. Well, I don't have them to show you here this morning. I have something better to show you. I have a verbal epiphany of my experience, and this is it in a nutshell. Reflecting on the ability that God launched me with and then the role of Christian education in developing me with. In spite of the trauma and even systematic dysfunction that was a part of my family's experience at times, my mother portrayed and created an environment of steadiness and security that was my launching pad as an adult. And I stand in tremendous appreciation for it. Yes, I've talked about some of those, mind, those elements here. And actually, my mother took me about as far as she could. Then I met a Christian teacher who, who allowed me to meet Jesus. And I want to tell you, Jesus took me the rest of the way. And I have good news for all of you. Nobody is bound by your past. Nobody. Unless you choose to live there. Unless you reject the discipleship of Jesus. Nobody's bound by their past. God can actually take your past and weave out of its brokenness a special understanding for others that are facing it. And he can give you a strength to not only declare how you got out of it and what Jesus did for you in the midst of it, but how others can get out of it too. Jesus can make something of the brokenness. But everybody needs somebody in their life to whom they can have a commitment to their personal growth. Emotional barriers can be secrets in any family as a like plaque in the arteries, Friedman says. And it's not just that these emotional barriers, you refuse to address what's wrong with your family. When I do premarital counseling, I assure the people that I'm not going to go tell their family stories and they don't have to tell me anything they, want to t they don't want to tell me. But when you start looking at your family of origin, you better be honest or you're doomed to repeat everything they did. And usually there's lots of good to repeat. 
But sometimes there's a few things. And Friedman will say, when you fail to acknowledge the emotional trauma in your past, it's like having a blockage in an artery. It doesn't just hurt where it's at. It stops the blood flow to everything that goes beyond it. Now, it's important for us to realize there are some things that hold leaders back. From the parents to the presidents is Friedman's phrase. One of them is fear. Fear has got to be the most elemental human emotion that can rob people of confidence. It's the first emotion in the Garden of Eden. It'll be the last emotion weaponized to get you to deny God during the age of the mark of the beast. Just know that. Fear. The second is ignorance. If you haven't really read the Bible, you might be living with a supposedly Christianized version of how human relationships work, but it might not be very Christ-like. And I'd suggest to you today, in our age of supposedly syrup, syrupy, almost superficial grace that we're talking about, that that is going on. We're going to have to reacquaint ourselves with the real Jesus who found himself bruised by some of his relational interactions. Dishonesty is number three. If you can't recorrect your course, if you can't take a new navigational uh, reading of where you should be going because you might not have got that quite right, you're in big trouble. And the last one is pride. So let's talk about fear, first of all. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1, we have a repeated sentiment. Most of you have seen this before, and most of you have heard preachers preach on it before. But since I'm in the beginning of a series on leadership, I just want to make sure you know that your fear is everyone's fear. The book of Joshua chapter 1. We'll be looking at verse 5. Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. This is what God says to him. He says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I'll be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. So the real confidence for the emotional processing that is the big challenge to leadership comes from God. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it from the left or to the right, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate it on day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that's written in it. For then you'll make your way prosperous, and you'll have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't tremble or be dismayed. Functions of fear, I might add. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And let's go down to the last verse of the chapter, verse 18. Anyone who rebels against your commandment and does not obey your words and all that command, you command him shall be put to death. This is the leaders now talking to Joshua. And they say, only be strong and courageous. Now, if I had a mission for you, and I told you four times, be strong and be courageous. It might be because I know the fabric of your humanity and your natural tendency is, this scares me. And if you think any leader is any different, think again. What scares me now is not what scared me 30 years ago, but what scares any leader is the next chapter of growth. It's the next uncertainty. But God is saying to Joshua, live inside the principles of the law, keep my presence right by your side, and don't be afraid. And by the way, Jesus, writing through the gospel writer John, in the little epistle, John says, perfect love casts out what? Fear. Now listen, when Derek Morris, who's now the president of the Hope Channel in our General Conference headquarters, was preaching in Indiana Academy years ago, he preached a sermon that must have been good for this young leader to hear because it stuck in my mind through the years. Thank you, Pastor Derek. But I want to tell you, he got up there and he said, look, the phrase for fear that leads up to it is ek balo, cast out. He said, it's like taking somebody by the scruff of the neck and throwing them out. He used it in regards to Jesus' direction to us to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out leaders, send out servants, send out missionaries. Cast them out, Lord. But I want to tell you, you cannot become a leader while you're dealing with fear all the time. Yeah, you got to face it. Yeah, you got to deal with it. But you need love that has the power to crowd it out so that your fear is not in the ascendancy. Number two, ignorance. Ignorance is a terrible wound on leadership. Now, all of my faithful, conscientious Seventh-day Adventist friends, parents, pastors, leaders, teachers, administrators, please hear me carefully. 
I'm going to read what I have on this paper verbatim. I wrote it, and I'm reading it as it reads, word for word. Some are so performance-oriented in their Christian lives that the love that would birth the courage, the determination, and the commitment to live out their leadership calling is missing because they're always looking in the rearview mirror at their record. How'd I do? Did I make a mistake? Instead of facing forward to their goals and responsibilities, facing forward, genuinely looking out for the interests of the people they're leading. Years ago, my son almost severed his Achilles tendon on a Sabbath afternoon hike in Colorado. I was there on a motorcycle trip with my brother. I was actually driving his truck. Fortunately, the surgeon for the United States Winter Olympic team resided in that town. She did the surgery to make sure that the tendon didn't get severed the rest of the way. Now, we needed to go home, so I had a kind of a bronze-colored Dodge Dakota truck that my brother owned with a black trailer with motorcycles on, on it, and in the back of the truck laying there for the journey home was my son who had just recently come out from underneath the surgeon's knife. As I make my way across Route 24 in central Colorado, I'm coming down a grade. I'm coming to a wide spot in the road. It was actually a little town, but there was nothing there. There was a, a parking lot with kind of a, a restaurant or something there, and then another building, maybe a gas station. As I'm coming down the road, driving this truck with my son convalescing in the back, up the road is coming a lady in a Prius. Now, I had somebody, well, I'll wait to say that. She's coming up the road in a Prius. I happen to drive a Prius, by the way. And as I'm coming down this grade, she starts to turn right in front of me. We're going to have a head-on collision. She all of a sudden sees me and corrects course, but it's too late. I'm already careening off the road through the parking lot. The dust is flying. The anti-lock brake system is trying to keep my wheels from skidding through the parking lot. It's not doing a very good job. I'm looking at where we're headed, and there's a, a, a creek, a small river, and I'm thinking, we're going in. I'm praying to the Lord while I'm trying to keep this under control with a trailer behind me and a convalescing son in the back. And we come to a stop just before the truck goes down the grade into the river. When I get out of the truck... I walk over and the lady comes over to me apologizing, apologizing, apologizing. And here's what she said. She said, I was so worried about the person that was following me. I was looking in the rearview mirror instead of looking ahead. Now, I had a person send me between, between the services. They sent me this quote. It was a little plaque. It says, don't look back. You're not going that way. All right. And I think that's actually good advice. I had someone else send me a quote that said, yeah, as a Prius driver, they were probably looking at the gas gauge. They do that all the time. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, don't look back too much. Everybody has a rear view mirror in their car. Why? So they can glance and go. When you start looking, instead of glancing, you're not going to be going where you want to go. And even as a boy, I can remember reading in Guide magazine a story of a young man who was tasked with plowing a straight line. And you know, he was tempted, and he did. He had the horse and the plow hooked up, and he'd go a little ways and look over his shoulder, and he'd go a little ways and look over his shoulder. And finally, dad or grandpa came along and said, son, I'm going to show you how to plow a straight line. You pick out an object to where you're wanting to go, and you keep your eyes fixed on it. This is how it works. And this is how it works for Christians. It doesn't matter where you came from, although it has some effect. You can glance. If you're pausing for a moment, you can even look back a little bit. But don't live your life looking in the rear view mirror. It doesn't work. Besides, God can take your trauma and turn it into a leadership treasure if you will let him. And by the way, friends, as long as we're on the topic of ignorance, let's make sure we broaden the spectrum of leadership. We have Moses and all of his conflicts, hated often by his followers, his church members, resisted and fought by some of his leaders. We have Nehemiah having to go up against the false-hearted Jews, having to go up, up, up against the cowardly Jews that were rebuilding the wall and pulling out the beards of the nobles. We have David writing his Psalms. If you haven't read some of the first 30 Psalms, you have not read about a man who's locked in conflict and is frustrated. He's asking God to let them fall into their old pit and sometimes break out their teeth. 
Somehow in the scope of things, there's a spectrum for leadership that's not just what we call some of the more genteel categories. There's what Ellen White will call the firmer side of the leadership spectrum. And it needs to be there. Or we might find ourselves regressing in a national neuroses of security and safety. You can't raise your kids like this. You can't run a school or a church like that. You've got to look forward. Keep God by your side. Be wise and thoughtful and prayerful. Get a little counsel and keep on going. And how about Paul when he confronted Peter to his face? And how about Paul when God had to say to him, don't be afraid. You know, he'd been beat up and stoned and shipwrecked and abandoned. God said, don't be afraid. Nobody's going to attack you. Dishonesty. Dishonesty is a big deal. And it's not so much... What, well, I'm just saying what it is. Dishonesty is when you can't say to yourself, yes, I have a tendency to do that. Yes, I think I did that. When somebody you love is close to you and they say, ah, you're heading off on that. And you say, no, I'm not. Especially if you have an emotional response. Course correction will make you a better leader. Not acknowledging that you need one will make you a terrible leader. You'll just find out if you're not careful in front of more people about your mistakes. And the problem with leaders is their mistakes are often public. So we need to be kind of careful because they're taking bigger risks. Lastly, pride. Pride and fear are closely related, but pride is the sin which will make it easy to be ignorant and dishonest and fearful all at the same time, but look like you're not. All right, now take your Bibles. I want to talk about nature. How far does the apple fall from the tree? Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 2. 1 Chronicles chapter 2. You want to be a good parent? You don't want to live in an anxious setting? You want to raise kids who have some emotional stamina? They're not afraid of what's coming and are enjoying life right now. I'm going to show you how to do it. 1 Chronicles chapter 2, looking at verse 13. I want to talk about David's family this morning. David was one of seven boys. He had two sisters. We'll start with verse... Uh, we'll start with... Verse 12, Boaz became the father of Obed, Obed became the father of Jesse, Jesse became the father, here we go, this is David's dad. We know about Eliab because he contended with David when he went to fight Goliath. That's one of the seven names we know. Then Abinadab the second, Shemaiah the third, Nethanel the fourth, Radai the fifth, Ozum the sixth. David the seventh, and then you have the two sisters. We don't know where they're in the lineup of oldest to youngest. I'm guessing they're towards the older end. They were Zuriah and Abigail, the, the sons of Zuriah, were Abishai, Joab, and Asahel. Okay, I want to look at Abishai for a minute. Now, this is a nephew of David. I'm going to show you the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. Now, if you come from the family of fearings, by the way, you might want to read the book, Hind's Feet on High Places, since that's what it's about. And she does come from the family of fearings. And since all of us come from the family of fearings, we can take courage that God can turn that around. He can eject the fear. But I want to look at his nephews, Abishai. So go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Go back to 2 Samuel Chapter 23, we don't put the stuff up on the screen every week. You still need a Bible to come here. 2 Samuel 23, and I want to look at this. This is one of David's nephews, Abishai, Asahel, and Joab. They're all brothers. And in 2 Samuel chapter 23, we have the story of three men that go and get water for Bethlehem at great risk to their lives. I love this story. I love to preach on it. I'm not going to preach on it today, but I'm going to tell you those three men never had equals because they found a leader when he was in the dumps and at the risk of their life, they went and gave him a little taste of his childhood by getting him a drink of water. They brought it back to him and he refused to drink it because he knew where they got it and what they risked to get it. So he pours it out on the ground as an act of worship to God. But I want you to see, as we follow up on this, that there is a young man that's almost in the three. Verse 18, 2 Samuel chapter 23, it says, Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zuriah, that's his mom, David's sister, was chief of the 30. And he swung the spear against 300 and killed them, and he had a name as well as the three. He was more on, most honored of the 30, therefore he became their commander. However, he did not attain to the three. Listen, friends, 
when you come alongside a leader like David, who's being chased like an animal, not recognized for the nobility of his character and the future placement of his person on the throne, and you do something for a discouraged leader, you're going to make it into the category of those three mighty men that even Abishai, his nephew, who personally saved his life. And we're going to look at that. Abishai personally saves David's life. But he still doesn't make it into the category of the three because when you get into high-level leadership and you're dealing with strong crosswinds on the top of precipice mountainous crags, and every place you put your hand and your foot feels dangerous to you, when somebody comes along and gives you a measure of, I'm in this with you, a complete statement of, your security is ours, we're looking out for you, you get into a special category. Abishai never got into that category, even though he saved his life. Let's go, if we could, to 1 Samuel chapter 22 now. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 22. And I, I want to show you as we go, Actually, let's go to 1 Chronicles 18. 1 Chronicles 18. Go the other direction. Sorry about that. In 1 Chronicles 18, I'm going to show you a little bit more about Abishai before I go into some of the people that joined David. 1 Chronicles chapter 18. And I want to look at verse 12. 1 Chronicles 18, verse 12. It says, Moreover, Abishai, the son of Zariah, defeated 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong idea. It was not a one-man show. David divided his army up three ways. Zariah was in charge of one of them. In our scripture reading this morning, we talked about Saul and Abner. Now, if you could imagine those men lying in the middle of a camp with concentric circles, there are 3,000 commandos with them. David knows where they're at, must be prompted by the Lord, and he says to one of those that have gathered with him, a Hittite, and to his nephew, I'm going down into the middle of that camp. Who'll go with me? Well, I want to tell you something. The one guy hesitated, and Abishai didn't. He said, it's me. So here they are. It's an automatic death sentence. All you need is for one of those men to stir, one of the 3,000, and it's an automatic death sentence. At least so it would seem. They tiptoe through the, the, the sleeping soldiers. They get all the way down to the middle. And Abishai is, is bold enough to actually whisper, which I think I might have been afraid to do. But he says, the Lord has given him into your hands. Let me take this spear and it'll be over. Now, it wasn't a very wise thing to say because certainly in the midst of his final agonies, there would have been some expressions that were audible. But David, for a much higher reason, says, no, I don't have to take out the life of the man who holds the position I will later hold. I'm going to leave that with God. But get his spear and get his water jug and come with me. This required an amazing amount of courage. Now turn over to 2 Samuel 21, verse 17. This is all Abishai, one of his nephews. The apple wasn't falling too far from the tree. 2 Samuel chapter 21. And if you trace the lineage of Jesus, you're going to find other great men in that lineage. And this is uh, part of that lineage. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 17. We'll start with verse 15. It says, Now when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David went down and his servants with him, and they fought against the Philistines, and David became weary. Now, mind you, this is 2 Samuel 21. There's only a couple more chapters left in the book. I don't know how old David is, but he's made the mistake of thinking he's younger than he is. And fighting like this is not only an adrenaline rush, but it's a demand on the physical body. And he's no longer up to it. The problem is, Goliath has a nephew that's not too far away, it looks like. Then Ishbi Binab who was among the descendants of the giant. Maybe he was a son, I don't know. The weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze in weight, was girded with a new sword, and he intended to kill David. What a great way to inaugurate this sword. I'm going to take out the guy who took out my dad or my uncle. Verse 17, conjunctions matter. And here's a three-letter one. It says, but, but, Abishai... His nephew, the son of Zariah, was right there with him. 
You want to become a leader? Hang out with leaders. You want to become a leader? Watch what leaders do. You want to become a leader? Find the confidence in God that these leaders have found. And if you want to become a leader, surround yourself with other leader-like people. Zariah, his, her, daughter, her son, Abishai, had not only been an apple that had fallen from the same tree, but he had hung out with his uncle long enough. And fortunately, the new sword of Ishbi Binab would not be christened with the blood of the giant killer, David. He steps up and he says, not today. And they're looking up into the eyes of that giant, just like his uncle had looked up into the eyes of a giant. There's a showdown. Fortunately, David's alive at the end of it. So is Abishai. And the message is, your days of fighting with us are over. This is Abish Abishai. Now, I won't take time, but I will tell you this. Joab was no ordinary soldier himself. And Amasa, who actually worked for his cousin Absalom when there was a rebellion, was also no ordinary soldier. And then you have Asahel, who was not afraid to chase Abner, which was his undoing. These are all the descendants of Jesse. And the strange thing is, is that they all have the courage of a lion. And it's not an accident because the spiritual upbringing of these kids and then the actions of the leader generation ahead of them was such to say, don't be afraid if you're on God's side. Now, let's go to the nurture side very quickly. And I want to do this. I'm not going to take you there to read it because I want to keep rolling here. When David was running away from Saul, what kind of people joined him? I want you to think about this. What kind of people joined him? Well, let me read you what the easy-to-read version says from 1 Samuel 22. It says in verse 2, many people joined David. There were men who were in some kind of trouble, men who owed a lot of money, men who were not just satisfied with life. All kinds of people joined David and became their leader. He had about 400 of them. The New American Version says it this way, everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented, they gathered to him. I'm not hardly confident that that kind of ragtag way of beginning of resistance force is the best kind. But that's how it happened. But you know what? They were transformed. They became some of the fiercest, most faithful, most loyal, most courageous people on the face of the planet. And they were willing to be chased with David around the, the wilderness of Sin and of Ziph and all these other places. You see, here's the truth of the matter. No matter where you started and no matter where you are, there is the ability for you to become a leader as long as you connect to the source of love and conviction. As long as you find a network of people like you, even if it only be one or two, there is the potential that the fear that has uh, assuaged you and, uh, and worked against you can now be traded in for courage. Now let's go to another group of people. I'll read you the names. You figure out who they are. Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphys, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot. Now I can tell you right off, you've got four fishermen. One of them becomes kind of the voice of the place, gets himself in a lot of trouble. We tend to think of him as a leader, but he showed the most cowardice at the very end. No, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. No, blankety, blank, blank, blank. I don't know him. Leave me alone. That's the main leader. And there's one who said, I'm not going to believe unless I touch him. And then you've got the CPA who was the tax collector. You know, there are certain kind of personality types and you don't ever hear from him. But I want to tell you, I've been to Madras, India. I've been to Chennai. I've stood there where Thomas is probably buried. And every one of these 12 men with the exception of the betrayer, and with the exception of John, died a martyr's death. What happened to them between the night they all ran away and the end of life? I'll tell you what happened to them. When you read in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, this is what it says. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus, Jesus, do you know something? We're coming up to a colossal pressure cooker, not too terribly different than the court of Caiaphas in the end. And you know what? The devil's going to use fear instrumentally in a calculated way to get you to say, no, I don't know him. And you want to know that this Seventh-day Adventist church, not only this village church, but 
This general Seventh-day Adventist church is being called to lead the charge and say, yes, I know him, and I'm not afraid to tell you, you're the ones that took his life. We're being charged with giving a message, and the devil's trying to hold us back with fear, and it can't work. But if you don't get a few steps between the life of a wimpy kid and Mr. Universe, you're going to stay left in the diary of a wimpy kid. Because leadership's like a muscle. It has to be exercised with discretion, with tact, but it's not technique that's critical to leadership, although it's an effective tool. It is character and love. And when you don't have that, you can't lead. And if you have that, even if you're afraid, God will set up an environment because he's the ultimate life coach and he'll get you there. All right, I'm going to bring this in for a landing. I started this message. I wish... I wish I would have told you at the beginning that uh, my mother, strange thing, you know, she was backslidden Adventist. I don't know that she had ever met Christ. She's a, she's a prayer meeting attending, mission going, tithe paying, offering giving, there at church Adventist now. She was baptized about this time of year last fall. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, when I grew up with her, she didn't live that way. And but she did tell me that my uncle, Ron, wouldn't go into a liquor store with my dad. I went into liquor stores regularly with my dad. And I hope to come out with a, a cigar, uh, a bubblegum cigar. I mean, those marketers are slick. Sell those kids bubblegum cigars. My mom and dad smoked. There was no way I was going to smoke. My dad drank. There was no way I was going to drink. I saw the downside of it. But I will say this. Starting this message out, I told you that my mother held the emotional line in my home. And she held it in such a way that everybody got to hang on to a little bit of security, a little bit of dignity, and a little bit of respect. Last, a few nights ago, my wife and I were sitting around after I got home after some evening appointment, and she said to me, your mother's one of your heroes. Well, for that phase of my life, for sure, she, she, she will forever remain. Because there was some trauma in our home. There was definitely some dysfunction. Three times my mother held the line. She did not surrender. She hepped her nerve. I'm going to tell you what they are. The first was early in the life of this preacher when she's got a cigarette tray sitting on the arm of the chair next to her and she's holding this little bitty baby and looking down at me with those gentle mama eyes even though she was a rebel. She wasn't a rebel through and through. And she told my dad... These kids are going to be going to church school someday. My dad said they're not. My mom said they were. You've heard some of this before. It's okay. I'm going to repeat myself. She held the line. Later on, it was another issue that came up. My father had an unfortunate period of his life with alcohol. I've talked about it here before. It was traumatic. The home was destroyed. My mother was beat up and bruised. And this is what my mother did. She moved out into another bedroom. Now, she could have left the home. I want to tell you what she said by what she did. She said to my dad, I still love you, but you will never, ever in a million years treat me like that again. I'm a step away from the front door. But in fact, what she said to all of us kids, because I remember the day, I can tell you where I was on the road, I can tell you what store I was in front of, because my heart had gone cold towards my dad, and my mother also held the line, and she said to me, he's still your dad. I want to tell you something, this is not a failure of nerve, this is leadership. And then finally, when I'm a 14-year-old, and I can look down into her eyes, and I've been made fun of at the church, at the church when, she, when I occasionally went. She says to me, you're going to that church school. And I said, I am not. And she looked at me and said, you are. I went to crying eventually and begging. My mother held the line and I'm behind this plexiglass pulpit this afternoon because she did. And I'm here to tell you from the parents to the presidents, if you don't create an environment of security that somebody's in charge, somebody loves, somebody cares, somebody will risk the emotional relationships, including the favor of your firstborn, then you don't have what it takes. But I want to assure you, Jesus can give it to you. They took note that he had been with Jesus. I'm here to tell you, friends, it's not complex. She, it's not complex. And eventually I told my mother, 
somewhat reminiscent potentially of her statement about my uncle not going, my Seventh-day Adventist uncle not going into the liquor store. I said, Mom, I am not buying you cigarettes anymore. (laughs) And you know what? She quit probably seven, eight years ago, a lot longer than I wish she would have. But I'm telling you today, (laughs) my grandma's prayers. And by the way, my grandmother, (laughs) the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. (laughs) My grandmother put the kids in church school. My mom, one of three girls, my grandpa went and took him out. You know, this is back in the 50s, maybe the late 40s. My grandma went and got him out of public school. She put him back in the church school. My grandpa went and got him out. My grandmother ended up divorcing my grandpa over the destiny of her kids. They got back together, but my grandma said, you will respect my maternal instincts for the spiritual well-being of these children. Leadership. If you would have ever met my grandmother, you wouldn't have put her up on a big pillar and said, there's a leader, but I'm going to tell you what, she was. She didn't have to go around touting her great leadership gifts. She just knew when to draw the line. And she wasn't going to have a failure of nerve when it came to everything she had wrapped her heart around. And neither should we. You want to become a leader better than you are? Fine. Wrap your heart around the love of Jesus. Wrap your heart around the love of the ones he's called you to serve. Hang on, write it out, because the real leader is not the one with the most data and the best education. It's the one who has the emotional capacity, divine gift from heaven, to love enough to say, I know what's right, and I'm not deviating from it. Friends, we're on a journey. The destiny of our kids hangs in the balance. The destiny of our institutions. As we sing this closing song, which may be new to you, go ahead and learn its tune. It's actually a children's song. And let's take its refrain to heart every day with Jesus. Let us learn to love, sacrifice, and serve, and we will become leaders like Jesus. Amen.